All righty. So, um, all right. All right. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to have on today Professor Rehan Durmas, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, to discuss Syriac Christianity and early Muslim Christian relations. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Rehan Durmas, and I'm an Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, as you've just um, mentioned. Um, I work on the history of Christianity in the medieval Middle East and um, Christian Muslim relations as well, um, cultural encounter and exchange between the two religions, again, mostly in the medieval Middle East. Um, in my research, I mostly focused on um, literary and cultural history. My first book that came out a month ago um, investigates, for example, um, the, the shared stories between Christianity and Islam and the um, sociocultural processes that catalyze those transmissions. And then currently I'm working on um, another book that investigates forms and expressions of Christianity in the medieval Middle Eastern countryside. So these are my areas. Excellent. Thank you for that, uh, Professor. You know, uh, you came very highly recommended, and so I'm super grateful to have you on, and excited for um, I think our important discussion today. Actually, more of a, pr a presentation. Um, kind of just before we start, um, I was hoping you could tell us a bit about yourself and kind of what got you interested in the field. I know you told us about your research, and we'll talk about that again at some point. But just yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So it's been quite a long trajectory. Um, I've done my PhD in religious studies um, and and I worked on hagiography. Um, I guess I can start before that. I, um, during my graduate studies, before coming to the US, um, I investigated religious minorities in Turkey, mostly the Syriac Christians. Um, and the plan was to um, work on the current um, cultural heritage management issues, but I got very interested in the medieval history of it. So I did a degree um, in the architectural um, history of the Syriac um, Christian community in Turkey. Um, and then um, another uh, made degree in medieval studies and medieval literature, medieval Syriac literature. Um, so it was a chain of personal interests um, that are all tied to um, the, the current state of the religious minorities in Turkey. Um, and that curiosity and training led me to my PhD work um, at Brown University, where I investigated um, hagiographical traditions um, and of, of the Syriac, um, of Syriac Christianity mostly, and um, the transmissions of those stories between Christianity and Islam. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think it is, we can say that it is a, 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 a number of personal interests, um, the context that I, um, grew up in, um, plus, um, training under really the best scholars of Syriac Christianity brought me, um, to where I am today. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Professor. Um, and with that, I would, uh, you know, uh, you can feel free to get started in your presentation. Okay, um, can I share my screen? Let's see, so before I dive into the um, presentation here, um, I want to briefly talk about what I'm going to do. Um, perhaps I can do that as this is going on. Let me let myself. Um, so I want to, can you see the presentation? Yes. So um, I will talk about Syriac Christianity um, today. I will uh, begin with broad definitions, um, um, the terms that are important to know, and then um, the, very briefly the current state of um, Syriac Christianity, different Syriac Christianity. Then I, then I will go back in time um, and talk about the development of uh, Syriac Christianity in its um, Roman context in antiquity, or uh, more properly speaking, in late antiquity, a term we will talk about. Um, and then I will take us to about 
seventh, eighth century, um, when Syriac Christianity encountered um, um, Islam, um, and which was a big um, changing point, which was a big um, turning point for the history of Syriac Christianity. So we will talk about early medieval period as well. Um, and uh, we will talk about texts as well as uh, material culture. So. So first of all, by Syriac Christianity, we refer to those churches whose liturgical language is the Syriac language. Like Syriac is the Edessan dialect of the Aramaic language, um, which is a Semitic language, and it was the lingua franca of the Near East um, before the Hellenistic culture. We will return to that. So this dialect, um, the, the earliest textual evidence we have for this dialect comes from the second century common era um, in inscriptions as well as some of the preserved texts. It has been a liturgical and a living language until today. So people, various communities still speak um, um, different dialects of Syriac language and um, the language is uh, also spoken, is used as a liturgical language. Syriac is a very important language for the history of Christianity because after Greek and Latin, Syriac texts constitute the third largest corpus of writings for early Christianity. So it's essential to um, um, you know, know Syriac if we want to have a holistic picture of uh, the history of early Christianity. For example, um, one of the earliest illuminated uh, gospels is in Syriac, which is um, um, a, a folio, which is you are seeing here, the Rabula gospels uh, produced in the sixth century in Northern Mesopotamia, where the language itself emerged. So Syriac Christianity has expanded to a broad geography from the Eastern Mediterranean to Southeast Asia and beyond. So there is no homogenous Syriac culture or specific expression of Christianity in Syriac. Syriac Christianity is quite a broad category. For example- then, um, Professor, just, uh, yeah. just a quick question. I mean, um, is Syriac a, um, is it a purely a Christian language or were there non-Christians who used Syriac at all? That is a great question. So at the beginning, um, and I will speak about this a little bit, in the beginning, um, pagan as well as Christian individuals seem to have used Syriac language. Um, in the beginning, by which I mean before the fourth century common era. Um, but today it is mostly used by um, Syriac Christians. But because it is, it's a language that is spoken um, in a broad geography, basically every continent of the world. Um, it is um, many communities are many communities that use Syriac are bilingual or trilingual communities. Um, in some communities, it's only a liturgical language, while in others, it's also the daily language. Um, so it is it is used by a broad community. So uh, we. It's mostly used by Christians today, but historically, um, pagans used um, Syriac um, Christian as well. Um, and Aramaic, of course, um, um, of which Syriac is a dialect, was used um, by, um, by um, um, Jew, um, Jews as well. Um, so Syriac um, is not restricted to Christian communities. So, um, just to just to um, illustrate the broad expanse of Syriac Christianity, um, we can take a look at these two standard reference works um, that are essential for the Syriac Christianity. Um, if we look at the chapters of the volume, the Syriac World, for example, this is um, this came out a few years ago, um, and part four, um, as you see here, I've highlighted that um, has. Um, it explores Syriac Christianity in Central Asia, in China, in India, um, and um, under the um, Ottoman um, dominance in the Middle East and beyond. Um, so by just looking at the table of contents here, we get a sense of how um, broad of a geography we are speaking about when we speak about Syriac Christianity. Similarly, um, here's a screenshot from a very essential um, 
the source um, Borgias Encyclopedic Dictionary of the Syriac Heritage. Um, and um, if um, you were to go through the entries here, um, we see an enormous geographical and cultural diversity across two millennia. All this is to highlight that under the broad category of Syriac Christianity, we have diverse traditions. Um, just two examples um, on the on the left here, we are looking at the Xi'an Sele, um, which is an eighth century um, Sele from um, Central Asia. Um, and it is a bilingual inscription in, um, in Chinese and Syriac. Um, and um, on, on the right, uh, we are looking at a folio from a Portuguese uh, manuscript that depicts um, Syriac Christians in India. Just two um, examples from really a broad variety of cultural expressions. So to dive into some of the technicalities here, um, I want to, you know, these, these graphs are always um, very, simplistic and most of the time inaccurate. But um, I want to place Syriac Christianity within the variety of um, Christianity, uh, um, 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 gen broadly speaking. Um, so due to a number of significant theological and political turns in history, today there are multiple Orthodox and Catholic churches that hold their liturgy in Syriac language. Um, in this, again, very simple chart, um, here we see that the last line here is called the Assyrian Church. Then we have Oriental Orthodox Churches. Um, then we have a category for Eastern Orthodoxy that um, includes Byzantine um, Greek Church and Serbian Church, um, Russian Church and others. Um, we have Catholic Church and then we have three um, churches that separated from um, Catholic Church. Um, again, a very, very simplistic chart. Um, chart. Most of the Syriac speaking churches fall under these two categories, um, the Assyrian Church and the Oriental Orthodox um, Church. But as you can see from these um, lines here, um, some of these communities actually um, um, adopted um, 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 Catholic Christianity. So just to zoom into, um, again, one more, one more uh, very simplistic chart, but just to zoom, zoom into the variety within Syriac church here, um, as you can see, um, this, these churches refer to the Assyrian churches uh, that we saw in the other um, graph right here. And then right above um, that we have um, Syriac Orthodox, Syriac Catholic, and Maronite Church. Um, and this graph um, should also um, incorporate um, Syriac churches in India, um, and Syrio Malabar and Syrio Malankara churches. Don't worry about these terms. Uh, but there is a broad variety of churches um, that hold their um, liturgy in Syriac. So all of these churches have Syriac rite. Um, and as you see, there are other churches that um, hold their liturgy in Greek. Um, so that's the main distinction here. But within the Syriac churches, there is the East Syriac rite and there is the West Syriac rite. So not all Syriac um, liturgies are held the same way because of theological differences. Um, there are certain um, phrases um, that are different between the East Syriac and West Syriac, right? And some um, parts of the liturgies hold differently. Again, these are very technical um, details that we don't need to get into. Um, but um, but th this is, again, just to highlight the variety within Syriac church, not in terms of only um, geography, but also um, different um, types of liturgies that are held in Syriac Orthodox and Catholic. So this is the um, diversity today, um, and it's only really scratching the surface um, of this very diverse, um, literally and um, materially diverse um, tradition that we call Syriac Christianity. But how did this diverse uh, form of Christianity look in its earliest stages of development? 
And for that, um, we will go back in time and speak about how Syriac Christianity looked in the beginning. So Syriac um, language and Syriac Christianity emerged um, in this borderland between um, two empires, Rome and Persia. Here, we are looking at the heartlands of Syriac Christianity. As I've mentioned, um, Syriac language was a local dialect of Aramaic spoken in Edessa, right here in northern Mesopotamia. So for those of you who may not be familiar, um, before the establishment of Hellenistic, that is the Greek, um, um, the, the Greek cities in the fourth century before common era, the lingua franca of the Near East was Aramaic. Um, so, and it, it had various dialects, um, local um, dialects, and one of them was the Edessan dialect called Syriac. The earliest literary works and inscriptions in Syriac come from this area in northern Mesopotamia in the second century, roughly in the second century common era. For example, um, this mosaic is from the second century common era, Edessa, and it's a depiction of the mythological um, scene where Orpheus tames wild animals um, with his lyre, and the inscription here is in Syriac. If we look at the earliest Syriac writings, um, we see some traces of Christianity, but there are also writings that can be categorized as pagan. For example, the letter of Mara um, Bar Serapion um, looks like a, a philosophical exploration. Um, and the author, Mara Bar um, Serapion, um, scholars argued uh, um, argue um, was that was a pagan writings of Bardaizan um, is um, another example of early Syriac writings um, and he was most probably a Christian philosopher um, so Christianity philosophy um, other um, religious traditions really blend into each other in this time period but there are also translations of biblical books um, to Syriac from Hebrew um, and from Greek in this early um, time period. For example, the Odes of Solomon um, are, um, um, uh, were composed in around the first or second century in Syriac. Um, and, and that tells us that there were probably um, Jewish slash Christian communities. That's again a big, um, 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 big question that's been um, debated until today. How Jewish was Christianity, or whether there could be a Jewish Christianity in this time period? And we're not going to get into that. But um, translations of the Bible and um, writings like the Odes of Solomon um, indicate that there were um, or there might have been Christian communities who hold the liturgy in Syriac as early as the second century. And in a chronicle that um, was composed in the sixth century, um, we have a mention of a church in the year 200 um, in Edessa. So if we take the chronicle to be historically accurate, which is again debated, um, there might have been not only um, Christian writings, Christian communities, but also a Christian church by the turn of the third century in Northern Mesopotamia. So this is all the earliest evidence um, for the first four centuries of the common era for Syriac language and Syriac Christian communities. Um, until the fourth century, the historical historical record for Syriac Christianity is sporadic, and our reconstructions are conjectural. There were Syriac-speaking Christians, and likely churches used um, by Syriac-speaking Christians, and perhaps the liturgy was held in Syriac, but we cannot say with confidence that there was an organized Syriac church distinguished from other Christian communities. In other words, other than language, we don't know what aspects of belief and religious practice were different between, let's say, Greek-speaking Christians and Syriac-speaking Christians 
in the first couple centuries of the common era. This question of identity is quite central to the, to the study of Syriac Christianity. So I would like to spend a little bit of time here. So it's, it's first of all, um, misleading um, to think about Syriac Christianity in antiquity as a Syrian um, or as a Semitic form of Christianity. Um, of course, it is difficult to detangle ethnicity from religion in antiquity. And there was some overlap between Syrian identity and Syriac language, um, according to the texts from that time period. Um, some texts, for example, refer to Syrians as Syriac speakers and then use Syriac and Syrian interchangeably. So there is some overlap between um, the, the, um, the, the language used for um, the language itself and the language used for geography. But it is more complicated than that, but, right? Firstly, Syriac language and literary expressions flourished in cities that were deeply Hellenistic. Edessa, for example, was an Hellenistic city. So Syriac language and culture was intricately connected to Greek language and culture. As a result, for example, there are numerous Greek terms and expressions in Syriac language. Um, so it is misleading to refer to Syriac as an Eastern language expressing an Eastern culture. Some scholars argue um, for a Semitic or Jewish origin for Syriac culture, and others argue for a Hellenistic um, Greek or Western origin. Um, this Hellenistic versus Semitic is, of course, a false binary. It's a political binary. And early Syriac culture was probably both in, in many ways. Syriac and Syrian might have been used interchangeably by some ancient and modern authors, but it is mostly inaccurate to use it that way because Syriac language was used beyond the Roman province of Syria and other languages such as Hebrew, Greek, Armenian, and others were spoken in Syria. So Syriac Christianity is not a local Syrian expression of Christianity. But since it developed and flourished in the Middle East, Many people in and outside of academia make that equation, understandably. Now I will walk us through literary, material, and theological aspects of the early centuries of Syriac Christianity, and will show why trying to place Syriac Christianity on either side of the East-West um, divide is problematic. So here is an, another simplistic charge that, a chart that I'm um, showing you. It's a timeline for um, Syriac Christianity for the medieval um, Middle East. As I've said, earliest textual evidence um, we have is roughly from the second century, and these texts um, very much fall on that divide between the Hellenistic Semitic binary, that is the false binary. Um, then, Two centuries forward, from the fourth until the sixth century, we have the so-called golden age of Syriac literature. Most of the writings that we have, um, the foundational writings for Syriac Christianity and Christianity in general, um, come from um, this, this period. And this period is also um, conventionally referred to as late antiquity by scholars. So it's really important to place Syriac Christianity in, um, um, in the late antique period as an important participant um, of that time period in the Near East. Now, as Syriac literature flourished in this time period, we see very complex relations um, of this community or Syriac speaking communities with the Roman um, and Persian empire. And we will talk about um, these um, relations, especially in the realm of theology in a bit. Shortly after this flourishing of Syriac literature, especially in the fourth century, we have the earliest surviving examples of Syriac material culture. Um, some of the earliest churches and monasteries date to um, roughly to the fifth century, um, sixth century. This is the time period where we see um, a, the rise of Syriac monasticism in northern Mesopotamia. Um, so there is, um, as 
buildings were erected. We have um, many hagiographical writings that um, were produced in monasteries um, and in other contexts. Um, fifth and sixth century are also important um, because um, we have very important church councils um, in this time period. Again, we will talk about these councils um, and the separation of Syriac churches from the imperial, that is the Greek Orthodox Church. So until um, about the fifth century or even the sixth century, we have Syriac speaking communities, but we don't have a parallel Syriac um, clergy, parallel to the Greek um, Orthodox or Imperial clergy. Um, but with the sixth, um, with the fifth and sixth century, um, Syriac churches separate um, officially, separate from uh, the the Byzantine Church, and they have their parallel um, clergy and uh, clerical hierarchy. Seventh, eighth century um, is again very important because Syriac Christians encounter Islam in this time period. They flourish under um, the early Islamic rulers. Uh, most buildings. Um, come from the 7th, 8th century. Um, they seem to have been built or repaired under um, Islamic rule. And this is also um, the time period um, when Christian communities, Syria Christians, uh, Syria Christian communities expanded into Asia, um, Southeast Asia and um, other places. Um, so after this 8th um, to 10th century, um, we will probably not be speaking about this today, but um, it's, an, um, it's quite a, a, an interesting period where um, because of the ongoing um, conflict and territorial um, competition between um, the Islamic Caliphate and Byzantium, Syria Christianity remains to be on the border between these two imperial powers. Um, so the, the complex relationships again continue in this time period um, between the Christian Empire and um, the Muslim Empire. Um, and all of this leads to uh, what scholars call the Syriac Renaissance, um, a time period in which we see a voluminous um, um, writing activity, um, the most canonical and most um, interesting and uh, very important medieval Syriac writings come from um, this time period. Um, and um, sadly, we will again um, not be able to talk about this today, but um, it's quite interesting um, that we have a time period, it's called a renaissance um, in Syriac literature. Um, remember, fourth to sixth centuries was the golden age of Syriac literature. Um, there is material activity, there's some building activity in between, but then the literature picks back up in the 11th century. So there's a, um, there's a slow um, period in between in terms of literature, but in terms of material culture, we see quite an interesting continuity in Syriac, um, Syriac culture. So this is a timeline, um, again, very simple. And these, of course, periods are not clear cut. Um, they all blend into each other. Um, I want to zoom into um, um, different aspects of um, these developments, um, particularly literary, um, material, and theological. So when we say Syriac literature, um, there are multiple genres and um, multiple types of writings, forms, and um, linguistic uses um, that we're referring to. Um, and the major categories um, we are talking about are um, Syriac translations of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, um, which is called the Peshitta. Um, and the 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 meaning of this word is simple or shortened form. Um, it's translated in different um, in different ways, but it refers to um, the Syriac translations of the Bible. Um, we have a big corpus of um, poetry, homilies, and hymns. Um, very important um, examples of which come from fourth. Um, to, through the seventh century and beyond. Um, a, a, an important corpus of writings can be categorized as exegesis and theology. And some of them are of course expressed in, um, in verse. 
Um, so some of the you know homilies, uh, hymns, and poetry can be categorized as exegetical um, poetry. Um, a very important um, subcategory of Syriac um, literature is saints' lives and martyrs' acts, both from the Roman Empire and from the Persian Empire, um, or a better way of phrasing that would be both um, by Christian, Syriac Christian communities um, living under the Roman Empire um, and um, under the Persian Empire. Um, there are historiographical works that are quite important because they incorporate um, Greek historiography um, and they um, adapt that tradition to Syriac historiography. So in terms of historiographical practice, these are very interesting works. Um, and they're also interesting because some of these works, and we will look at some examples soon, some of these works are um, quite unique in witnessing important events like um, Mongolian invasions or um, the uh, expansion of uh, emergence and expansion of Islam earlier on. Um, we also have treatises on asceticism, monasticism, and pastoral care. Um, and um, canon law is also very well developed and um, extensively written about in, in Syria. Um, and uh, we've mentioned translations um, of the Bible, but there are also um, translations um, of philosophical works, um, other um, literature from Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, Armenian, and others. There is quite an extensive um, corpus of translations in Syriac, and some works actually um, are only preserved in Syriac. So um, the Syriac literature is important for um, Having a um, having a broader and more holistic understanding of world literature um, in the medieval era um, as well. So um, just just some names here. I will not go through them one by one, um, but um, if you are interested, you could um, start with uh, Sebastian Brock's um, brief outline of Syriac literature. Um, these are some of the most important um, 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 authors that wrote in Syriac. Um, for example, um, Ephraim the Syrian is called the Harp of the Holy Spirit, um, and his homilies and hymns um, are quite foundational for Syriac Christianity. Um, Jacob of Sarug, again, another um, um, homilist, um, he's, he's, a, um, he's a bishop and his writings um, include a big corpus of homilies that are exegetical in um, in nature um, um, and some of them are um, polemical. It's again, a very important corpus. I can't really prioritize one person over the other in this list, but just um, pointing out some names here, John of Ephesus, um, um, has a, a church history uh, that's quite extensive. Um, and he also has a biographical collection that is called The Lives of the Eastern Saints. Um, again, no need to go through them one by one, but this list pretty much takes us through um, the, the Syriac Renaissance we just mentioned. Um, and this is a very selective short list of Syriac authors. Just to give some examples to these writings, um, Ephraim the Syrian, as I said, um, left um, tens of, um, um, if not hundreds of hymns. Um, the perhaps the most well-known are the Nisibene hymns and hymns against Julian, um, but he has other very important works as well. Um, in These are important because they witness quite significant events in the history of Christianity, because for example, hymns against Julian, um, is is a um, is a uh, corpus of writings that um, that criticize Julian, right? Um, criticize and chastise um, um, the last um, pagan Roman emperor Julian the Apostate, um, and Nisibene hymns um, praise the history of Nisibis, where he um, where he preached and lived for a while, uh, modern day Nusaydin. Um, for example, a very interesting episode um, in these hymns 
is where um, the city of Nisibis was conquered by Persians and Ephraim the Syrian witnessed that in person. He saw uh, the Persian flag um, at the fortress um, above the city. And that also um, happened to be the day when he saw Emperor Julian's um, dead body being carried in the city. Julian left, um, Julian lost to Persians. The Roman army lost to Persians. Julian died in that um, Eastern expedition. And that whole um, 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 conflict took place near Nisibis. So Ephraim, um, in one of his hymns, says, I'm looking at the corpse of this, of this pagan, of this sinner. And then I'm looking at the Persian flag that is um, waving above my city. And he, he equates the two, right, as God's punishment. Um, so um, he is reading all of these um, um, events through theological eyes, and it's quite interesting to see this perspective of a, um, of a Syriac Christian author. Um, Narsai um, was an East Syriac um, poet, um, lived around the same time, quite um, a, a little later than Ephraim. Um, and he wrote, for example, Nimra on, um, on the three doctors of the church, three East Syriac um, theologians. Jacob of Saruk, uh, whom I mentioned, um, this is one example to um, his writings, homilies on the women whom Jesus met. Um, he doesn't title them this, but uh, we, a group of us translated these homilies. It's, um, it was published a couple of years ago. Um, if you're curious, go check it out. It's quite interesting. Um, um, four homilies on four, uh, four different uh, women mentioned in the Bible. And we see how he expanded those tropes and biblical stories um, to instruct his community. John of Ephesus, as I said, was a church historian. He has an ecclesiastical um, history and uh, Lives of the Eastern Saints um, is one of the canonical works of Syriac, um, Syriac literature or classical, we might call them. Um, anybody who is curious about um, saints' lives and cults in um, late antiquity, um, this is one of the places to start reading. Um, Isaac of Nineveh um, is known for his treatises on mysticism and asceticism, quite important figure from the eighth century. When we say Syriac um, canon law, um, Jacob of Edessa should come to mind. Um, in around the same time period, around eighth century, um, we have a very important um, Syriac chronicle, Chronicle of Zuclin. Um, and we will talk about this chronicle in a bit, um, but I wanted to put this in here just to highlight the historiographical tradition. Um, a part of John of Ephesus' history is lost, um, but it is preserved in the Chronicle of Zuclin, for example. And Theodore Bar um, um, Konai or Koni, um, I also wanted to mention him as an example because in this work, Scolion, we see one of the more extensive um, depictions of Islam. Um, he places Islam among other heresies. Um, and it's quite interesting to see this Christian perception and presentation of Islam to a Christian audience. So again, if you would like to read more, um, Sebastian Brock's um, short book is a great place to start um, to read about Syriac literature. We know about all of these um, works and more thanks to the rich manuscript tradition um, that are um, most of which is pre um, preserved in um, digitized for form in HMML. Um, Vatican Library and the British Library um, also have many digitized manuscripts, but also uh, many more um, non-digitized ones. Another place um, to check would be uh, the Damascus Patriarchal Library, as well as St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai and Church of the Forty Martyrs in Mardin. Um, there are multiple uh, digitizing projects going on um, currently. Um, so we know more and more every day, which is very exciting. Um, and it only testifies to this voluminous um, um, corpus of manuscripts.
I just want to briefly mention um, the difference between these two um, visuals here. Um, these are from um, manuscripts. Um, the Syriac manuscripts, but you can see the difference in um, in letters, right? This is a called this more Bakhti um, script. It's called the Estrangela script, and this more round um, script is called the Serta. Um, and it's important because um, these two scripts are adapted by different Syriac communities, East, mostly East Syriac um, communities who um, lived and flourished under Persia, um, have, have adapted the Estrangela script in their manuscripts. And then uh, West Syriac Christians um, um, have used Serta mostly. Um, so this is to highlight that these um, scripts do correspond to certain expressions of identity within Syriac church. Okay, so, so far for Syriac texts and writings, um, how about buildings? I have a few slides here to show you um, Syriac architecture um, and I want to bring us to the bigger question of whether um, we can speak about Syriac churches and monasteries. Um, here are four examples, all from northern Mesopotamia and all um, built somewhere between the fifth through, or perhaps even like fourth in this case, fourth through. Uh, um, the 7th slash 8th century. Um, most of these buildings are quite difficult to date because of um, multiple renovation um, renovations that have taken place throughout history. But here are four examples, right? They don't look quite like each other. Um, and we can see this boxy dry stone architecture in all of them. The limestone is used very extensively in most of the Syriac churches because of the location, right? These are all in Northern Mesopotamia. Um, but other than that, there doesn't seem to be much that connects um, these two, these four churches. So, so how do we find and how oh, sorry, do we just, find? Um, a, a quick yes. question kind of, uh, if you go back, I mean, were these, were these built as churches yeah. or were they converted from like, I don't know, pagan temples or, or something else? So um, these were all built as churches, um, but there are of course hagiographic traditions that tie these sites to um, pagan cults or pagan temples. Um, if we look at, for example, the hagiography that is related to um, the, the history of the monastery of Mar Gabriel. Um, it was found, founded by um, two saints, um, Samuel of Eshtin um, and, um, and, um, um, and later on renovated by um, um, Gabriel, um, whose name is attributed to the monastery today. Um, and according to the life of Samuel of um, um, Eshtin and um, Simeon of Katmin, um, those two saints found this monastery um, and they, um, they, they, they remove themselves from a pagan village. They um, um, go on this journey of founding this monastery and it was um, built um, on a site that was marked by an angel. Um, so there is, uh, and similarly in the life of um, Jacob de Recluse also, we um, see many stories about um, pagans and how these saints, um, you know, fight pagans and um, erase paganism and convert communities to Christianity. Um, so if we take those stories um, as accurate um, accounts of what historically happened, um, we can presume that um, even if these sites were not built on top of pagan temples, um, there was, of course, a pagan history of these towns that slowly um, changed to the favor of Christian communities. Um, but architecturally, we actually don't have um, much evidence that uh, might indicate a, a pagan temple. Um, 
I don't have the photograph of that, but um, the monastery of Deirul Zafaran in Mardin um, has a crypt um, and it is called a sun temple. Um, but um, there is actually no indication that it might have been a sun temple. Temple. It, it looks like a crypt, uh, which many churches have. Um, so reading architecture, in light of literary sources, um, takes multiple um, presumptions and certain methodological um, um, choices. Um, so the short answer is we don't have much evidence as to whether these particular buildings were built on pagan temples. Um, but again, hagiography is full of those um, conversion narratives. So um, the question um, I would like to raise with these um, buildings is how do we find and how do we define Syriac architecture among other late antique buildings of the Near East? Uh, can we speak about a distinct idiom um, for Syriac churches in antiquity? Um, as I've mentioned, like all in all built in dry stone wall in a bulky style, but many Greek-speaking Byzantine churches were also built in similar style in Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia. For example, um, this beautifully ornamented um, arch, here we see this um, arch, is, um, is in the baptistry of one of the earliest cathedrals used by Syriac Christians. It is in modern-day Nusaybin or Nisibis in southeast Turkey, and Jacob of Nisibis and Ephraim the Syrian, um, who I've mentioned, um, two very famous fathers of Syriac Christianity in the fourth century, preached at this very church. The cathedral is destroyed, but the baptistry has survived, and we are looking at the um, baptistry um, here. Um, it is still used as a church and a pilgrimage shrine since it houses the burial of Jacob of Nisibis in its crypt, as we see on the right here. If the remaining decorations of the baptistry is any indication, uh, this must have been a spectacularly decorated site. I will show a couple more examples here. These are the um, um, the doors on the um, 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 opening to um, which side of the, I think it's to the um, south of the baptistry. And these decorations, as you see, are really um, very beautiful, spectacular. Um, and these patterns are known from um, many late antique Syrian and Byzantine churches, right? Um, here I will see, I will show you another um, door from the interior this time. Again, very um, intricately decorated limestone. Um, and in on one of the piers, um, again um, on the interior of the baptistry, we see this beautiful garlanded um, um, acanthus leaves decorating um, the the pier um, capital. And um, this pattern um, would be classified as classical or Hellenistic um, in, in scholarship. So what is what is Syriac about this? Um, just to contextualize, um, these are all from um, quote unquote Byzantine churches in Syria. Um, and the Church of Mar Jacob um, does not differ in quality of the execution of the stonework or the artistic forms from any of these churches. Um, these are all using, again, this cut acanthus. Some of them are uncut. Um, on this um, pure capital, we even see a Syriac and Greek um, inscription. Um, these are all contemporaneous with uh, the baptistry we just looked at. So um, again, it remains a question whether we can speak about a distinct idiom of Syriac churches in antiquity. Um, we looked at this photograph before. It's the uh, monastic church at the monastery of Mar Gabriel. Um, and um, this church itself was most probably built in the sixth century. And it looks like a, a Byzantine church, right? With its elaborate brickwork um, here um, at the, um, at the um, vault, um, as well as around the arches of these windows. Um, this brickwork is um, often, uh, um, termed or referred to as Byzantine brickwork. Um, and the, um, the sanctuary of the church is also decorated with these very elaborate gold mosaics. 
Um, so um, it's very much um, a, a Byzantine church in many ways. Um, and I will add one more um, building from this very monastic site. Uh, it's an octagonal chamber uh, with this brick dome. It is called the Dome of Theodora, commemorating the 6th century Empress um, Theodora, um, Byzantine Empress Theodora. So material evidence testifies to not a distinct Syriac Christian art and architecture, but a complex cultural history intertwined with the Byzantine Empire. And um, this, this church was most probably actually built by, built with uh, funds coming from Rome in the sixth century. If this is the case, um, why did Syriac churches separate from the Byzantine or the Greek Orthodox Church? And that takes us to um, the realm of theology. Um, we will need to, to like, so this is a, quite a big question and we will need to look at um, multiple events, um, not only church councils, but other um, events as well in the first 500 years of Christianity to understand the separation process of um, Syriac churches from the Byzantine church. And I will not go through all of that history, but um, just mention these two councils here. They are quite important for the history of um, Syria Christianity. The first two ecumenical councils, the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, um, all churches universally accept them um, and they adhere by um, their, um, their decisions about um, God's um, nature, unity, um, and um, the creed of the church. But when we um, look at the Council of Ephesus, um, we see um, very important separation disagreements. Um, this can be summarized as the question of the Theotokos. Um, Theotokos is a Greek term, and that means the God bearer, that's, an, um, that's a name um, um, given to Mary as the one who bears, who, the one who carries God, Theotokos. Um, Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius, um, who was coming from a, a, a Syriac tradition, um, disagreed with this term um, and uh, proposed Christotokos. Um, he said, God cannot be born in human body. So let's not call Mary the God bearer, let's call her Christ bearer. And um, this, this disagreement um, ended up uh, being very, um, being quite disadvantageous um, for him. He was condemned as a heretic um, at, this, um, at this council. Um, and um, and uh, his followers, he was exiled after this council, but his followers, um, most of which were Syriac speakers, um, were, were deemed heretics um, after this council. So they left the Roman Empire and many of them were either um, exiled or um, they took refuge in the Persian Empire um, in the fifth century. And their followers are called Nestorians. Um, it's, a, it's not an accurate term. It's not um, a term um, that scholars prefer to use, um, but um, the, the Church of the East is um, often referred to as Nestorians uh, because of this controversy um, um, that Nestorius himself um, was a part of. So that's the first separation, and that um, council, the Council of Ephesus, is taken as the um, point at which the um, the Assyrian Church or the East Syriac Church um, or the Nestorian um, Church was established. Then we come to the Council of Chalcedon, just twenty years after the Council of Ephesus, and in this council. Um, after it's established by the imperial church that Theotokos is a good term, is an, is an orthodox term, um, the question this time was whether um, Christ had two natures or one nature. So um, there were those who said Christ had only one nature and that nature was the divine nature. 
Okay. Um, so um, the, the, this group is called, because of this, this group is called monophysites. Mono is one, physis is nature. Um, conventionally, we can translate it as nature. So monophysites um, um, are those who advocate that Christ or who, who um, argue that Christ had only has only one nature and that nature is divine. While um, that argument was being developed, um, the, the official decree of this um, council was that Christ had two natures, human and divine, um, in one person. Um, so person is a, a very loaded theological term. We can think about this as a, a body or space in some contexts. So in one persona, um, Christ had two natures, human and divine. That was the decree, that was the um, final decision of this council. And as a result, all of those who argued that Christ had one nature, um, um, and that's the only, only the divine nature, were condemned um, heretics. And um, many um, Syriac churches um, followed those theologians um, um, as th those theologians who argued for one nature. Um, and as a result, once those theologians were condemned heretics, those communities were um, um, were in a position to either follow them or um, you know make their own um, decisions as to the the, the future of their communities. Um, and uh, many of them as a result, separated from um, the imperial church. And this is the point which we can take as the official establishment of um, Syriac clerical hierarchy. There are um, other councils that follow these fifth century developments in which emperors um, like Justinian, for example, Empress Theodora's husband, um, Justinian tried to reconcile the two groups. They, for example, proposed will of God instead of nature or person of God. So they played the terms in these councils, but then um, the monophysites or the so-called monophysites did not agree with these reconciliations um, and um, they remained separate from, from the imperial church. Um, many of them were exiled in these um, processes there were persecutions. Um, we don't know how many people were killed or forced to conversion. Those persecutions and exile um, are, are written about in quite martyrological and hagiographical terms. So um, it, it, it is, again, a matter of methodology, um, um, how to reconstruct those processes. But we know that there um, were imperial persecutions due to um, the disagreements during, um, after and before even um, these councils. Um, and uh, that's why we should take them as quite important um, developments in the establishment of um, Syriac churches. So these um, conflicts and persecutions um, in the Roman Empire, um, theological conflicts um, um, and persecutions in the Roman Empire um, led to quite important developments, one of which, as I mentioned, um, was movement towards um, the Persian Empire. Um, the so-called Nestorians, for example, already had moved to the Persian Empire and they sought asylum um, and they lived under um, Persian rule. Um, and the Persian Empire um, at the administrative level were Zoroastrians. So um, they, um, the, the Christians in the Persian Empire had more autonomy in some ways than Christians in the Roman Empire who were in conflict, who were in theological conflict with the imperial church. Um, that is why we see a flourishing of the East Syriac church um, in and beyond um, the Persian Empire towards the East um, um, and especially in Central Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, 
Um, so the, the, these um, political developments and these imperial dynamics led to different trajectories for um, those Syriac Christians within the Roman Empire um, versus those who um, lived under the Persian Empire. There were, of course, a lot of power negotiations and occasional persecution in the Persian Empire as well. I do not want to draw a binary picture where there are suffering Christians, suffering Syriac Christians on one side and more free um, um, and autonomous Christians on the other. That's not um, such a black, um, black and white um, um, picture, uh, but still um, we have quite different um, imperial um, processes for these two um, Syriac communities. Um, so these um, conflicts take us to um, roughly the um, second part of the sixth century, early seventh century. Um, and as these conflicts between um, Christians happen in the Roman Empire, um, quite a Big development happens in the Near East, uh, which is the coming of um, um, Islam, the emergence and development um, of, um, of Islam in um, the Hijaz and quick spread of um, 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 the Islamic world, as some scholars refer to it, um, in the Near East and beyond. So I would like to turn to the question of Syriac Christianity and its relationship to um, Islam in the seventh century. Here we are looking at um, the map of the Near East and this color code refers roughly to, of course, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. Um, the, um, um, the early Islamic community here in the Hijaz. Um, and as you will see, this is also marked um, as um, the same color with this one, because there were probably um, um, missionaries or um, other groups from the Persian Empire to South Arabia. Um, and you will see this connection here along the Nile, um, and this is the kingdom of Aksum um, in modern day Ethiopia, um, and its connection through the Nile to Alexandria and the Roman Empire are quite, um, 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 is quite important, um, not only for the history of um, these imperial powers, um, but also the history of Christianity because this map um, with this color coding shows us that probably some East Syriac um, or Nestorian um, Christians um, were in South Arabia. And then with this connection, we can talk about West Syriac Christians and um, perhaps Coptic Christians um, being closely connected to or related to um, the Christians in um, Ethiopia and Aksum. Um, so these um, imperial connections um, directly translate to communal connections um, and the spread of Christianity to the various places um, in the Near East and beyond. And it's quite an important um, note for the history of Islam, right? Um, various scholars discuss the relationship between um, the development, the emergence and development of um, Islam um, and the Quran and the, the surrounding Christian communities um, in and around Arabia. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, that historical context. So what do we know about Syriac Christianity in Arabia until the coming of Islam in the seventh century? Um, there are multiple texts that talk about either Christians in Arabia or um, Arabs venerating um, Christian saints. We don't know if they are referring to Christian Arabs or pagan Arabs venerating Christian saints. So there is some literary evidence, but um, one needs to be careful reading them. For example, in the life of Simeon the Stylite, it's a fifth century um, text about that's narrating um, the life miracles um, and um, the the um, moral conduct of this pillar dwelling saint Simeon the Stylite, um, and um, in that life 
we um, have multiple mentions of Arabs um, coming from Arabia to the um, saint's shrine in northern Syria. So whether um, that testifies to that test testifies to Christian Arabs in Arabia by the fifth century, we have to decide again. We have to um, do um, close literary analysis and other and apply other methodologies to decide whether we can take such hagiographic depictions as um, um, Christian presence in Arabia in the fifth century. Another text that's quite important. Um, is the martyrdom of Aretas. Here we see a depiction of um, um, the martyrdom in the 11th century Menologion of Basil II. And um, this story narrates um, a Christian community in South Arabia that was uh, martyred by um, Jewish kings. Um, and um, that episode um, is also known as the Martyrs of Najran. Um, and it, it is repeated in enough number of historical sources um, and enough number of texts that it's generally accepted to, um, to have actually taken place, but we don't know about what it means to be a Jewish king in South Arabia in the sixth century. Um, we also don't know how big of a community this was. Um, so there are a lot of, again, layers of martyrological and hagiographical writing here, but um, this is a tradition, this or rather a dossier um, that talks um, about Christians being persecuted to some degree in South Arabia. Um, and Martyrdom of Aretas, the Book of the Himyarids, um, and um, other, um, other related texts testify to these events. And so we know in the 6th century, there were um, Christian communities in South Arabia. Um, another um, text is Life of Paul of Kentos and John of Edessa. Um, that text does not talk about this persecution in South Arabia, but it's one of those texts that talk about the evangelization of South Arabia by two monks from, um, from northern Syria. There are many traditions that speak about um, the evangelization of South Arabian pagans and convert their conversion to um, Christianity. This hagiographical text is one of them. So again, um, can we take this as um, a, a witness to um, the conversion of South Arabian pagans to Christianity in the fifth century? Can we not um, up for um, methodological um, and theoretical choices? And finally, I will just mention that in the Chronicle of Zukrin as well, um, we um, the Syriac Chronicle of Zukrin, we see um, episodes about um, Christians in um, Arabia, in various places in Arabia. Um, one question is that even if we can talk about um, Christians in um, South Arabia or North Arabia, um, can we identify them as Syriac Christians? Can we identify them as West Syriac or East Syriac Christians? Um, were there any Greek speaking Christians or were there only Syriac Christians um, in these peripheral, peripheral regions? These are all quite a big questions that we don't, we can't say much about. Um, if there were um, Christians in this area, the, they might have been um, missionary Christians from Persia, in which case they would be um, Syriac speaking um, and Persian speaking um, Christians um, who most likely adhered to the Church of the East, that is the Nestorian Church. Um, it is also possible that there were um, missionary saints, traveling um, holy men um, and clerics um, from the Roman Empire as well, in which case they could have been, <coughs> excuse me, they could have been um, Syriac speaking Christians from the West tradition, West Syriac speaking, West Syriac um, Christianity could have been in these regions. Um, we, again, um, cannot say much by just looking at the texts. 
this also um, like even the presence of Syriac Christianity doesn't negate the presence of Coptic Christians, um, Greek speaking Christians. Um, so all we know is that there were some Christian communities. There are um, important epigraphic evidence um, that are actually published as we speak. This article um, came out very recently. Um, and the, the article talks about a newly discovered Syriac inscription in South Arabia. A very important discovery. But what does it say about Syriac Christianity in South Arabia is still a big question. Because the inscription is in Syriac, but it's very, very short. And you can see the translation here. It says, Lord, have mercy upon me. Whoever passes through this road, let him pray for me. So it doesn't have any theological claim other than being written in Syriac. It does not have anything particularly Syriac about this um, about this inscription. And um, we can also say, we can also ask whether um, we can take this as a Christian inscription, right? Could it could it have been written by a um, a Jewish individual um, or um, or a monotheist? Um, you know, we, without a denomination or without a religious identification, it's all uh, these are all questions um, to be answered <coughs> um, with with further research. By just looking at this inscription, we can't say much other than the fact that Syriac was spoken um, in in um, South Arabia. So um, there is um, increasing evidence um, for um, the presence of Christians uh, and the presence of Syriac Christians um, in and around Arabia. Um, and as we've said, literary evidence also points at interesting um, directions. But what does that that evidence say in terms of the emergence of um, the Quran um, and um, whether there is any relationality between Syriac Christianity and Muhammad's preaching um, or um, the, the composition of the Quran. Um, these are quite big questions that have been um, explored by many scholars um, over decades, um, but I will just show a couple questions here um, and um, and um, show some of the examples um, that scholars um, highlight. One question that many ask um, is, does the Quran include Syriacisms, um, like any Syriac words or terms? Some um, um, scholars, for example, say the very word Quran is um, is based on a Syriac um, root, and it's related to the Syriac word keriono, which is a reading, or um, especially a reading in the context of liturgy. So by um, starting from that point, um, this group of scholars um, try to trace some words in the Quran to Syriac, um, to, and argue that um, Quran is based on Syriac writings. For example, one um, example they bring up um, is this verse here, um, chapter 44, verse 54. The verse goes, um, the, the verse is the one um, um, about the hoodies, um, the, the maidens or the virgins in paradise. Um, and the word for it is um, hurim. Um, and um, Luxembourg and a um, couple other um, scholars following him um, say this was probably a Syriac word or a Syriacism um, in the Quran. And the word itself does not mean virgin. It just means white grapes in paradise. So um, <coughs> they um, disregard the Islamic tradition that interprets this verse and say, the Islamic tradition um, has been wrong or partial about the interpretation of this verse. The word itself refers to grapes in paradise, not virgins. Another example um, is this verse here. Um, it's about the sacrifice um, of um, 
Ishmael according to the Islamic tradition or Isaac according to the Hebrew Bible um, and um, the Christian tradition by Abraham and the Quranic verse goes then when they submitted um, and Abraham laid um, him his son on the side of his forehead the word for forehead is um, is um, Jabin um, and again um, a few scholars say this um, is not a word for forehead um, but we can um, this should be translated as um, um, firewood um, because the word in Syriac um, means also firewood. But again, um, there, there, there's also a Syriac word that um, um, is related to um, this Arabic word here, and that means forehead. So it depends on which transliteration we pick um, and what um, translation we pick, and whether we choose to go to Syriac words um, for some of the Arabic words, or whether we take them as Arabic words by in and of themselves, uh, by themselves. So these are, again, uh, methodological questions. Um, this um, school of thought argues that um, by looking at Islamic tafsirs, um, uh, Quran tafsirs, we can't understand the Quran, which was a 7th century text. The tafsirs come at least two centuries after um, the Quran. So we have to look at late antique texts, late antique literature, and late antique literature and uh, languages um, to understand the Quran. Um, so we should turn to Syriac terms if we are unclear about a term in the Quran, um, and that's their methodology. Another question we have um, in most of um, the scholarship on the Syriac um, 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 language and Quran um, relationship is, um, is whether the composition of the Quran based on Syriac lectionaries or other Syriac texts, um, or whether it's a, um, a composition in and of that itself. Um, and um, there are interesting connections between certain Quranic passages um, and chapters with certain um, examples of Syriac literature, but there is no one-on-one -on -one, um, paraphrase or um, translation between any any um, a Syriac text and the Quran. Um, so th these connections are quite conjectural, but they are quite um, interesting arguments nevertheless. For example, um, in the Surat al-Kaf, um, um, we have quite interesting examples, and I um, analyze these examples in in my book, in the third chapter of my book, but I will summarize it here and um, talk about the question very briefly. Um, in this Quran um, chapter, Surat al-Kaf, we have four interesting narratives. After the opening verses, we have the Ashab al-Kaf, um, companions of the cave, um, from verse nine to 26. And then a brief commentary for a few verses. Then we have a parable of a rich man and a poor man whose fates are reversed. Um, and um, right after that comes um, the famous story of Moses and an anonymous servant of God who is identified as al -Hidr. Um And attached to that um, and connected to that story, we have the um, story of Zulkarnain, um, which is um, identified a character um, um, who is identified as Alexander the Great by medieval and modern um, commentaries, um, and ten um, verses in which the the chapter um, um, closes. Um, so these four narratives: companions of the cave, the parable of the rich man and the poor man. Moses and an anonymous servant of God who uh, instructs Moses about being patient and trusting in God's judgment and the story of Zulkarnain. Um, if, if we look at um, the, these, these passages and some of the homilies of Jacob of Serug, for example, um, they're actually quite interesting parallels. I will not summarize the parallels here, but 
just to just it's important to highlight that Jacob of Sarung um, has homilies about all of these um, all of these um, episodes. He has um, um, writings about companions of the cave, um, which is also um, the, a group also known as the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. Um, he has homilies about um, the rich man and Lazarus um, from um, the New Testament, which um, sounds like this parable in many important ways. Um, and um, he um, has homilies about um, Alexander the Great. Um, so when we look at his writings, there are um, interesting parallels to these, these um, Quranic episodes. Now, did Muhammad um, hear a, a recitation of Jacob of Sarug's homilies? Are these related or are these only um, resemble each other in terms of phrasing and characterization? Um, this is all up for methodological, again, choices. But it is quite interesting to entertain the possibility that um, there might be certain Syriac texts um, who, which were circulating in Arabia in the seventh century in oral form or in the form of lectionaries and short um, liturgical um, writings and compilations. And um, those um, <clears throat> those um, narratives and those um, homilies and poetry that was already circulating in, in Arabia might have been reflected in the Quran in quite um, intricate and subtle ways. Um, Again, um, there is much scholarship on this, um, and I um, suggest anybody who is curious to um, to just look at writings, for example, um, of Sidney Griffith, Gabrielle Reynolds, um, um, Angelica Neuwert, um, and um, I have recently also um, discussed these um, possible connections. Uh, Finally, Professor. a... So um, what what would be the language? I mean, so were these homilies um, by, uh, you know, a sixth century author transmitted, you know, through time um, and space, uh, but in, I guess, in the region of the Prophet, would they have been, I don't know, uh, recited in Arabic uh, for an Arabic audience, for Arabic speaking audience, or would it have been in Syriac? That's an excellent question. So, um... So Jacob wrote, Jacob of Sarug wrote, um, let me just go to um, this slide to highlight his name here, um, in the sixth century in Syriac. And we know that his writings um, circulated very broadly as far as South um, Arabia um, and um, Egypt um, and in various peripheral um, places. He was um, in um, Sarug, Northern Mesopotamia. Um, by the seventh century, um, so a hundred years after um, him, we have um, so we have multiple manuscripts that preserve his writings um, in Syriac. Um, so we can assume that if any Christian clerics um, or um, missionaries um, went to Arabia with his writings, they would have had it in Syriac, in perhaps um, manuscript form. Um, and were these poems translated to um, Arabic or would they be preached to um, um, communities in Syriac um, is, is a big question. And um, Philip Fornes recently published a book about um, Jacob of Saruk um, corpus and the social history behind the circulation of this corpus. And if I remember him um, and his scholarship correctly, um, many of these homilies, not only of Jacob's, but many of these Syriac um, hymns and homilies and liturgy would be um, translated to Arabic um, if the community that they're preaching to was Arabic. We know that there were Arabic um, liturgical books and lectionaries. Um, in by the seventh century, Sidney Griffith's um, "The Bible in Arabic" is a great um, book to start on this topic. Um, but again, 
because there were also Syriac speaking Christian communities, most probably in Arabia um, and in the, uh, in the surrounding regions, um, depending on what community these preachers were speaking to, um, the hymns could have been paraphrased, shortened, or um, read from a manuscript um, in Syriac, or we can um, imagine translators um, working ad hoc um, to translate these homilies um, to Arabic um, or, that, or various other um, dialects being spoken in, um, <clears throat> in these regions. So my answer is both. I think um, they circulated both in written form and orally in Arabic um, and in Syriac. Um, yeah, um, but, but, but even then, I think I, I find it really interesting to just think about what that means for the formation of the Quran. Um, even if um, there were Christian homilies about these biblical figures and um, um, biblical concepts um, translated to Arabic and preached in Arabic, um, whether we can take that as a subtext of the Quran um, or whether we should take the Quran independent of those developments um, is, is a question that I um, really enjoy thinking about. Um, and that brings me to the this final question here, whether the Quran is a simple believer's exegesis of the Bible. And we won't be able to answer this um, in this presentation, but um, I, I find it a, a, to be a very interesting question that should be added to these, this list of questions, right? Whether we can take the Quran um, to be um, a, a, a biblical exegesis, a biblical interpretation, a biblical re recital um, um, in, um, in um, um, in Arabic and um, by a simple believer. And that term has been recently proposed um, or rather developed by um, Jack Tanus in his book, um, The Making of the Medieval Middle East. Um, and um, he characterizes simple believers in that book as, as those who were not theologically uh, very literate, but um, who could be literate in stories um, and who were interested in religious practice for a variety of reasons, but um, who wouldn't be able to debate um, theological concepts. So can we take the Quran um, as um, an Arabic speaker uh, monotheist um, interpretation and re-narration of biblical events and um, interpretation of um, biblical um, and other concepts. Um, I will um, leave you with that question, but um, um, it's, it's a very interesting one to think about. So um, the, the final part of my presentation um, will be dedicated to this question here. Um, whether or not Syriac Christianity um, has a big contribution um, in the formation of the Quran and Islamic concepts. Um, by the seventh and eighth century, um, we know that many Syriac Christians, um, Syriac speaking Christians encountered Islam in, um, in the form of an imperial power. Um, so how, how, how did this impact them, right? whether Syriac Christianity impacted um, um, the Quran and early Islamic community and early Islamic concepts um, is one question. How did the coming of Islam um, impact um, Syriac Christians and other Christians in the Middle East um, is another very interesting question to add to that. And I only could include eight, um, you know, examples of um, books that deal with this question. Um, there is a growing body of um, a rigorous scholarship that is dedicated to um, the, the the life and theology and um, um, and material culture and law in um, Christian communities in the Middle East after um, um, the Islamic conquests in the seventh century. Now, looking at um, 
Syriac um, writings, um, there are quite interesting passages that witness um, the, um, the um, Islamic conquests. Um, and some of these um, um, texts are actually our um, like only source for a particular event. And they um, give us a really interesting picture about what happened um, in these communities when um, Islam and Islamic armies took over. Remember that especially in the Roman Empire, uh, many of these Syriac speaking um, Christians were in conflict with, um, with the Imperial Church, with the empire um, due to theological conflicts. So um, due to theological disagreements. So what happened after um, Islam took over and um, conquered the lands in which they, they lived? There is an entry in this chronicle that I mentioned before, the chronicle of um, the chronicle of Luqmin. Um, just as a background, it was written in the eighth century. Um, the first three books of this chronicle um, are, are 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 compilations from earlier chronicles, um, like John of Ephesus, as um, I mentioned, and then Eusebius and Sozomen, Byzantine. Um, chroniclers. And then the fourth part that um, goes roughly from the 6th century through the year 775 um, seem to be um, the, the original um, composition of the author. Um, it's, um, the author is not known, but um, it, 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 he seems to um, be a monk from um, the monastery of Zuknin in northern Mesopotamia, and that's why the chronicle is called the Chronicle of Zuknin. Um, and these events are quite in, because he seems to be um, the author. The final author seems to be an eyewitness to many of these events uh, or a close witness. Um, <clears throat> the fourth part, the fourth part of the chronicle, um, is taken quite um, seriously as a historical document. Um, and um, we we see one of the earliest um, witnesses to um, the Islamic um, conquests um, in this chronicle. For the year 620, for example, the chronicle says, in the year 932, um, the Arabs conquered the land of Palestine and the land as far as the great river Euphrates. The Rome Romans fled and crossed over to the east of the Euphrates, and the Arabs held sway over them. The first king was a man among them named Muhammad, whom they also called Prophet, because he turned them away from cults of all kinds and taught them that there was only one God, creator of the universe. He also instituted laws for them because they were much entangled in the worship of demons and cult of idols mainly the cult of trees. Because Muhammad showed them that God was one, because they vanquished the Romans in war through his direction, and because he instituted laws for them according to their desire, they called him prophet and messenger of God, and he ruled for seven years. This is very interesting um, because Muhammad is called the first king of the Arabs, the Roman defeat is um, depicted um, in quite um, quite dramatically, right? Romans fled and crossed over to the east, um, and Muhammad is the first king. Um, and the the establishment of Islamic um, um, concepts um, and the first Islamic law is witnessed in this. Um, entry, right? Muhammad instituted laws for Arabs. They were pagans, they were tree worshippers, but then they um, were converted to, um, by Muhammad, um, they were converted to the worship of one God. Um, and this note is very um, important um, because he instituted laws for them according to their desire. They called him prophet and messenger of God. So um, the the um, the emergence of Islam is not depicted here as a natural development or as a communal development, but almost like a utilitarian and almost um, like a utilitarian, I, I, I would like a better word, um, 
um, um, exchange, right? Muhammad gave the community walls according to their desire. Um, and because they liked this, uh, these laws, they called and they accepted him as a prophet. Um, I took out a passage here. And in that paragraph, the chronicler says, um, these Arabs are sensual people. Um, they are quite hedonistic. Um, and um, they, um, they, they value like bodily pleasures. And um, that's why Muhammad's message was packaged um, as essential. You know, these laws were um, um, to the advantage of these people and to their liking. Um, and um, they were in compliance with this very sensual lifestyle. And that is why uh, Muhammad was very successful. So it's a quite interesting um, outsider's observation of what is happening in Arabia um, and beyond um, in 620. <clears throat> um, and in the rest of the chronicle, um, after this first mention of uh, Muhammad and um, the, um, the conquests of the Islamic army, um, the majority of the mentions of Islam are about taxation. Um, the chronicler um, does not say much about um, Islamic beliefs, other than the fact that he categorizes um, Islam among other heresies. Um, and um, but the rest of the information the chronicler gives about um, the Islamic expansion is about taxation. He talks about how Christians were taxed, sometimes um, through really brutal force, um, how uh, men were taxed um, and how churches were pillaged sometimes for tax purposes. So tax is the big keyword for this chronicler when it comes to representations of Islam. I will show you another um, source um, written around the same time period um, um, as the Chronicle of Zuknin. This time we are looking at a hagiographical composition, um, the life of Simeon of the Olives. Um, he was a bishop of Haran in the 8th century, um, and he is called Simeon of the Olives because he planted uh, many olive groves and olive trees in northern Mesopotamia, so he is given um, that name. The life is recently published by this great group of scholars, so I um, really recommend you to um, read it. It's very lively. Um, it's a late hagiographical, late in terms of um, you know early Christian standards. It's an 8th century hagiographical composition, um, and it's quite interesting in showing us what was happening during the early Islamic conquests in um, rural Mesopotamia, right, far from um, the central um, um, regions of the Islamic Caliphate. So here we read in passage 17 that when Simeon wanted to build churches and monasteries in Nusaybin, Nisibis, he took a letter from the ruler who was in Nisibis and brought it to the great Caliph of uh, Babel in the days of Ma'mun, the chief of the Muslims. He took with him regal gifts which were fitting for the king, and he was received by him, the, the king, greatly, and he honored him a great deal, and he loved him and cherished him with all his heart. He got to know him and rejoiced at his speech and knowledge. He disputed with him concerning his faith and so that he responded with precision to everything he was pressing him about. He was giving him a straight and true answer. He had a great boldness with the great king of the Arabs and he praised him before all the wise men of the Arabs. The wise men and teachers of the Arabs responded to Ma'mun, the caliph, we will be victorious over him. So this episode, which goes on uh, for a um, couple other paragraphs, talks about this very interesting intellectual relationship between this um, Bishop of Haran and um, Caliph Mahmoud. Um, we, again, don't know if this relationship actually existed, if he actually went to the caliph, uh, the court of the Caliph, um, if he actually debated at the court about faith issues. It's likely, um, but um, there is some historical work that needs, uh, that needs to go into parsing out these passages and their chronology. But the hagiography um, does not depict Islam as this heresy or, you know, in any negative terms. Um, the, the 
author of this life seems to have accepted the um um the Muslim caliph, their local chiefs, um, as their rulers, and we we see a negotiation of power and negotiation of authority and a fight for autonomy in these Christian communities. Um, Simeon was building churches and monasteries, for example, and in the process, he gained the patronage and liking of the Muslim Caliph. Um, and um, he also, in return, gives the Caliph gifts. So he's almost put in equal standing with um, the Muslim Caliph, right? So this representation is quite different than the representation in the Chronicle of Sukhni. In another passage um, in the same um, life, we see, for example, um, that the king of the Arabs, um, was the, his heart was very glad towards him. And um, the, again, the, the ruler, the Muslim ruler built, um, no, this he is not the Muslim ruler, actually, this is Simeon, uh, built next to the church a large and beautiful mosque, right? Um, this bishop does not only build churches and monasteries, but um, he also builds a mosque for the uh, Muslim community in Northern Mesopotamia. So we see that by the eighth century, if we take this life um, to be more or less historically accurate, um, we see that by the eighth century, there were um, Christian communities, in Northern uh, Muslim communities in Northern Mesopotamia. There were intricate relations, relationships of patronage um, and um, and uh, in other nature uh, between um, Muslims and Christians. Um, and um, a bishop um, was in a position of building a mosque for the local community um, to sustain those um, friendly um, relationships and the patronage of uh, Muslim rulers. So this is, again, very interesting and very precious in terms of our historical information about that time period, the early Islamic um, era in the Near East. Um, I will not go into the details how these um, about how these um, relationships develop in the other centuries, in the coming centuries, but I will give one example to show how cultural encounter and exchange took shape, especially um, in this area um, in northern Mesopotamia. Um, this is um, a church that I surveyed um, a number of years ago in northern Mesopotamia in a small village um, called Zaz. Um, and um, it is dedicated to um, the Greek saint Dometheus, the healer. Um, he's called Dimet or Dumet um, in Syriac. This is a very simple church. It is not spectacular. Like remember the earlier churches and monasteries we saw um, at the beginning of the presentation. This church does not look anything like that. Um, it was um, rebuilt or built um, in the early 10th century. Um, and at its sanctuary, we have this Syriac uh, inscription and is dated with the Islamic calendar, um, like 320 of the Arabs. Um, and the person who is um, commemorated at this funerary, in this funerary inscription, is called Abu Yahya Zakari. Um, so that is an Arabic name um, given to a, uh, a Syriac Christian, and this inscription is also dated with the Islamic um, calendar. So um, this is one of the earliest um, Syriac or Christian inscriptions dated according to the Islamic calendar. It's very precious. Why is it in a small church in northern Mesopotamia? I have um, a, a short article um, that speculates about that, but we actually don't know. Um, Abu Yahya Zakari is not mentioned in a literary source. He was probably a, a local um, level, uh, local uh, mid-level elite, um, not a very um, um, high level cleric or, or anyone, um, but um, this, um, his family still seems to have connected to the Islamic um, culture, perhaps by trade or other ways, um, to the point that they um, named um, their son Abu Yahya uh, with, a, with an Arabic name, and they also adapted the Islamic calendar and used it in 
a very central important location in the church. This is the sanctuary and the inscription is at the eye level. Um, so this is just to highlight that um, all of those early encounters uh, with Islamic rule, with Muslim rulers and Islamic rule in general um, seems to have um, um, changed shape um, by mid 10th century, um, especially in the countryside, right? In the cities, we have, of course, Islamic cultural elements adopted by um, Syriac and other Christians um, earlier than the 10th century. By the, by the, but the countryside um, is very interesting. And the, um, these cultural interactions and cultural expressions that um, take place in the countryside um, um, is, uh, these are slower process, processes than um, those in the cities. And uh, we see that Islamic culture was adopted by um, this Syriac speaking community in the 10th century to a great degree. Um, so the story is um, many layers of encounter, exchange, debate, of course, conflict um, and persecution in some um, points. So we have to look at all of these different locations and modes of encounter and exchange to understand how Christian, uh, how Christianity um, took shape and, um, and adopted um, to, um, to Islam. Okay, um, I think I will, I will um, leave you here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to return to any of these topics above, uh, but I hope this gives a good overview of um, the, the history of Syriac Christianity until about the 10th century. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was that was amazing. Uh, great um, introduction. And yeah, thank you so much. And just kind yes. of let me. Yeah. Um, can I just unshare my screen so we can? Yes, of course. Decided? Or would you or would you like to um, return to any of it before I? No, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm okay. good. Um, just uh, I wanted to ask, actually, if you um, wanted to tell us anything about any future projects, any current research, any current projects, um, just tell us about it. Yeah, um, um, I'm happy to um, just briefly um, say what I'm doing these days. Um, I'm at the beginning of uh, my second book project, which will explore exactly these um, um, communities in the countryside. Um, so I am looking at literature and material culture to see what Christianity looked like in the medieval Middle Eastern countryside. And um, I'm now working on an article about what it means for there to be religious pluralism um, in the um, early medieval Middle East. What does religious pluralism look like, especially um, in regions far from uh, metropolitan centers? Um, so that's what I will be busy with uh, for the next uh, few years, just looking at um, rural landscapes um, and um, residential um, or ecclesiastical buildings um, in, in the countryside and, and see what we can say um, about these Christians who had limited contact and encounter with Islam. So um, they weren't in theological debates actively, they weren't um, 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 visible to um, Islamic um, law and regulation as much as um, those Christians who lived in cities. So I'm wondering what's happening in villages. Um, and in a side project, um, I want to I wanted to step beyond the chronological boundaries um, of the um, Middle Ages. Um, and I was wondering um, about Middle Eastern Christian um, uh, Christians in, in the West. Um, so I am um, now reading the first Arabic um, newspaper published in the US, Kalkab America. Um, and um, it was published by, um, it was founded by um, Lebanese Christians um, in the 19th century in New York City. It's the, again, first Arabic newspaper um, in America. Um, so I'm I'm reading that um, to see how Middle Eastern Christianity um, found expressions um, in America and how it changed American religious landscape. Um, I'm very excited about that. 
um, project as well. So these two um, are what I'm busy with these days. Understood. Excellent. Thank you again, uh, Professor, uh, for giving us so much time and this excellent presentation. And um, with that, I'd Thank like to you. conclude the episode.